I've been living in the time uh, data analyst. I work in the New York City Controller's Office and uh, Policy Bureau there. Uh, so our policy shop, we uh, to talk about kind of big picture issues facing New Yorkers, uh, find out what the challenges are that you're facing and propose policies to build a more equitable city that offers better services to people who live here. Uh, we are going to be talking today about a project that I led uh, last summer looking into city bikes for a lot of their learning. Um, so just uh, how we're going to go through this today. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about the report that we published and the, the key findings about policy recommendations, um, but then jump into uh, the data we used, the methods we used, and then at the end, uh, of a little bit of a sort of hands-on practice government, how you can kind of take this method and, and back up with it. Um, so why did we do this project? Uh, we started this analysis because um, more and more people were complaining that they were finding city bike to be less reliable than ever, uh, finding stations like this with no bikes available or pulling into a station with their bike and finding a full of bikes so that there were no docks available to return, right? Um, this was increasingly a problem, you know, at a time when uh, a few years into Lyft's ownership of the city bike system, but they were looking to kind of dump city bike entirely. So we wanted to build, you know, look at what was going on for riders and then propose ways to, to build a more reliable city bike system. Um, so just quickly what we found in the report and then I'll get into how we did it. Um, we found clear disparities in service across the system. Um, so that some neighborhoods area park hadn't pretty reliably cut service, but areas around the edges of the system, uh, service was much less reliable. If you're familiar with the geography of New York City, this all makes sense, but I'll go into exactly how we sort of came up with this and like by name, but the places with poor service are also home to more Hispanic, black and lower income residents. And, you know, we also found that this, uh, this poor reliability comes at a time that city bike has really cut back on the, the actions that they were doing to rebalance bikes, to move bikes out of full stations that then into empty plots. Uh, we are a policy shop, which means when we find problems, we like to propose solutions. And we really want City Bike to work. We really want the city of New York to be a better partner with City Bike to make that happen. Um, we think that they can get there by uh, amending their operating agreement. Specifically, we'd like City Bike to report uh, much more granular performance standards, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, but we find these neighborhood disparities and so we'd like to track those. Um, We'd like the city to enforce uh, its existing operating agreement, um, but in addition to sort of just uh, the sticks of enforcement, also provide uh, carrots of, of targeted incentives for city bike for exceeding its performance. And I think that will uh, get to better service, especially in some of the, the recently expanded neighborhoods. And then uh, last week, we just want to improve the transparency of the data that city bike is reporting. Um, so it's great that I was able to do this analysis and do it all with data that is publicly available. Uh, but it would be even better if I didn't have to do a whole bunch of analysis to find these things of state by just letting us know how they're how they're doing. Um, great. I'm going to jump into the nerdy part of this too, but happy to, to come back later and talk about anything that we found and uh, the recommendations that we have. So first, the data that we use. So we started this project, and as I said, we we were just looking to understand. What is the reliability across the system? You know, where are there areas uh, where, where services is less reliable? We started by looking at city bikes on the operating reports. So they give a report, publish a report publicly and give reports to the city every month, reporting how they're doing. Uh, the problem was this comes out once a month, uh, comes out usually about a few months delayed. So when we started looking in May, the, the most recent report was from March. And then the uh, data that they publish is only average you know, for one or two points over the month. So either you know, when average for the whole month or just uh, first half of the month, second half of the month. Okay. Um, and it's average citywide. So there's just one measure of reliability across the entire city. And uh, yeah, we suspected that, especially as the, as the system was expanding, that the reliability was, was not going to be citywide. Um, so we needed to find a better source of data. Um, you know, in the rest of this conference this week, you'll hear about all sorts of great data sources that are available on New York City Open Data, and you can just go pull them down and start analyzing them. Uh, there's not one of those for City Bike. <laughs> um, what City Bike does have, though, that we could use is they publish a real-time data feed. Uh, and this is, so this is public, it's online, anyone can access it. It's 
published for um, basically navigation apps. So like Google Maps or any other app that you pull down it, that's going to give you real-time directions from a place that has a bike to a place that has a dock. Um, so this tells you at every station the number of bikes available, the number of docks available, the number of broken bikes. Um, it's a data feed, and depending on your, uh, you know, inclinations towards data, this either looks like, you know, some person, uh, someone, one of my colleagues sent it from my, my shoulder when I had this up on my screen and said, like, is your computer broken? <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you, if you work with JSON data, you'll recognize that this is a super structured JSON that has a data schema, which just means it's very easy for a computer to read this. Um, this is, uh, so this is great data to use. Uh, the challenge is that by design, this is only real time. So I can pull up exactly how many bikes are available at every station right now. Uh, it's updated every five seconds. Um, but I can't tell you how many bikes were available five minutes ago or a week ago or a year ago. So the first thing that we started with this project is just started recording its real time data to build up a longitudinal data set that way. Um, so I set up this action on GitHub Actions, and I'll talk to you very specifically how to do that at the end. Um, but this is just uh, a little process that runs uh, on a fixed timer, uh, um, runs on its own on GitHub Actions, goes and grabs this data every 15 minutes, um, finds the timestamp on that data for when I was last updated, and just saves the file. <laughs> um, so started running this uh, the end of May uh, when we started this project. And then after two months, after we had full, uh, full June and July data, we thought, like, that's probably enough for us to look at. Um, and so just took each of those data samples and combining them together into a single data set. Um, so we got timestamps every 15 minutes throughout two months and every station, uh, which then we can, we can do stuff with, right? Um, so this is the data we used. Uh, we recorded this for a few months over the past summer, but I've, uh, as I said, I'm going to share with you code you can use to start recording this data right now and then build up this data set and do whatever you want with it. Um, but I'm going to talk now about what specifically what, what we did with it and, and how we found all of that. Um, so the first thing that we did, uh, just again, this, this raw data uh, it is great. It tells you at every station things like how many bikes are available, how many docks are available, how many uh, broken bikes are at the station. Um, but what we wanted to know was um, not sort of just those those raw numbers, but really translate that into what's the experience for bike riders and, and, and what's what's the reliability of the station. So I looked at a whole bunch of different measures and looking at different times of day, uh, days of the week, sort of different different ways to cut this. Um, but sort of talking with our whole team and thinking about what would matter most for, for riders and, and matter for sort of the policy implications here, we settled on a few sort of key overall measures for reliability. The first was the frequency that a station had no bikes or no docks available. And we constrained that just to the sort of peak morning and evening hours, the times when, when most riders were out looking for bikes or docks. Uh, second measure is the duration that stations were left with either no bikes or no docks. Um, and for these, we, we just limited the time span for basically daytime hours, 6 a.m. to midnight hours, that we're not counting like really long overnight duration. It's a better effect so much. And then the third measure, uh, which wasn't something I really expected to look at, but sort of popped out when we started recording the data, is the portion of docks at a station that have broken bikes. Um, and this is sort of a double whammy because it's a bike that's broken that you can't check out. And it's also a dock that you can't return a bike to. Um, and it turns out that uh, there's sort of shockingly high portions of, of docks that have broken bikes. Uh, uh, that's, that's also cool. So those are the three measures. So then we could we can compute these sort of average measures uh, over the course of the two months we were looking at, and then start putting them on the map. Um, so this is the first step of, of this analysis: is sort of finding what you know what what are the right service measures, putting them on the map, taking a look at the pattern. Uh, this is basically what we saw when looking at one of these first measures. So this is this is reliability. This is the the frequency that bikes are uh, bikes uh, sorry the frequency that a station has no bikes or no docks um, during either the morning or evening hours so it basically represents the likelihood that you as a rider would, would walk up to a station during those those morning or evening hours and then find either no bike or no dock um, and so you know and then I'm looking at this I look at the map I'm like oh okay like we got something here like this is a this is a story right you can see me looking at this map. 
a strong suggestion that you've got pretty good service in the, in the core of Manhattan and, and a lot of areas with pretty poor service right around the outside of the system. Um, if you look again at that, that third measure for the portion of station, uh, portion of um, excuse me, portion of docks at a station with broken bikes in them, uh, this is where like I, I was shocked how uh, these these numbers are that across most of the Bronx, like a third of the docks were loaded up with broken bikes, and so that's that's not a, a very useful system. And, and again, you see a pretty big sign of a geographic despair here. Um, and then just from these uh, these raw data and, and our estimation of the durations that um, stations were left with no bikes or no docks, uh, we could kind of directly compare that to city bikes uh, service level agreements in their operating agreement. Um, so those say basically that, that city bike is not allowed to have a station uh, empty or completely full for more than an hour in peak hours or more than two hours anytime. Uh, we counted more than 11,000 instances when they were uh, probably had, had uh, extended past that time frame just within the two months we looked at. Um, and there's a, a potential fine associated with that, which is like on the order of $800,000. Um, so that probably could have been our whole report. Um, these are great maps. Uh, you can look and see like there's a pattern going on here. You can see there's a, there's a big number that, that City Bike owes us. Um, but I wanted to take this analysis just one step further beyond this map. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, the first is our human brains are really good at finding patterns in arrays of dots, even if there's nothing there but sort of brains. Um, that is why astrology exists. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's a good check, like even when there's, it looks like there's a pretty clear pattern like this. Um, to apply some some statistics to this and say, like, what are the chances that what we're looking at is actually something that, that could have just happened by random chance, right? The second thing that I wanted to do with an additional level of analysis is we have this great continuum here of, uh, you know, poor service in some stations, better service on other stations. But I wanted to pick out, like, what are the air, what are the areas with pretty bad service, right? What are the places where people could live? Uh, one of the places where people do live, where the stations in their neighborhood have poor service. And so sort of compressing this variability into, into more of a bind. Um, and then the last reason that the clustering was like a, a, a good thing to look at here is that clusters of out of service stations are actually a whole lot worse even than individual stations that are out of service, right? If the, the station right outside your house doesn't have bikes and you can walk two blocks and get a bike there, like that's a bummer. It's going to slow you down five minutes, but that's okay. Um, but if all of the stations, you know, within say half a mile of your house have no bikes, then you just don't have city bike anymore, right? Um, so what we wanted to do uh, is look at some clusters of poor service across the city, right? So I'm going to talk now in maybe excruciating detail about exactly how we did this, but you know, who's my audience at Nandio? Um, <laughs> so clusters, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of ways to cluster data. That's basically the whole field of data science, right? Uh, so we use for this, though, a specific method um, that's uh, a spatial or, or geographic specific method, which means it, it does a good job of accounting for where things are actually physically located on Earth, um, which is actually something that a lot of data science clustering methods don't take into account very well. Um, and then it's also a method that, that provides sort of a statistical validation, which, which gives us an answer to that, that question of like, how likely is the pattern that we're seeing, how much, how likely could that just get you in a product of, of random chance? So this method is called the Local Indicators of Spatial Association. Um, specifically, it's a local Baran's eye, uh, developed by a spatial econometrician named Luke Anselin. I give you his name because if you're interested in spatial analysis, he is an excellent teacher and posts a whole lot of YouTube videos. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great method uh, for looking at spatial clusters and getting a statistic. Uh, I'm going to walk through the steps of this even more specifically, but, but basically, just to, to, to give you the, the, the overview, what we're doing here is looking at the measure of reliability at each station and comparing that to the average measure of reliability and all of the neighboring stations. Then we're picking out just the places where the reliability is poor at the station we're looking at, and the reliability is poor across the average of all the neighboring stations, right? 
And then we're going to further limit that um, by picking out just those hotspots that are most unlikely to have occurred by random chance. Mm -hmm. So step one is just defining what are the nearby stations. And uh, what we use here is something pretty standard, but I'll just flag that like a lot of what you get out of spatial analysis will hinge on what you choose for what is nearby. Um, and this is something that you just have to choose in the model. Um, but what we looked at is we said a, a nearby station is one with that half mile. Um, we use just a straight line distance, not sort of the street grid network, but that, that'll get you an approximation of like how far is it reasonable to walk to the next station. Uh, and then we weighted those by an inverse square, which just means that the closest stations count for a whole lot more, and the stations out at that half mile edge count for a lot less in this weighted average. So what we do is across all of the stations, uh, we have the measure of reliability, we compute the weighted average reliability of all the neighboring stations, right? And now we can put this on a plot. And this is, this is called autocorrelation. So correlation, how well things go together. Autocorrelation means we're looking at how well things go together with themselves at another location. Um, so we're measuring here. This is, this is our measure of uh, the frequency that stations have no bikes or no docks during the, the morning or evening hours. So across the x-axis, this is the measure at the station we're looking at. And then up, up the y-axis, it's the weighted average of that same measure for that station, right? Like, nod once if you're with me so far, or if you don't care. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> we got um, what we're planning here is the, uh, the, the measure of reliability at the station that we're looking at. So that's the frequency that at stations are uh, not available. And we're plotting that against the same value at all the neighboring stations. And what this means is that sort of this upper right quadrant here, these all these points all represent stations where the service is more unreliable at the station we're looking at, and the service is also more unreliable across the average of all of the nearby stations. Yes? What would it look like if that wasn't true? Like it, the chance that one station is unreliable is not really correlated. Yeah. So if this just looks like basically a, a blob, a round blob, that means there's no pattern. And you brought up actually what's interesting about this plot, um, which is because we see, so this red line is the, is the trend line here. It's, it's a pretty clear positive slope. And that means overall system wide, Stations that have poor service are mostly surrounded by other stations that have poor service. Stations with good service are mostly surrounded by other stations that have good service. Yeah, this is across the whole system. Right? This is across the whole system, yeah. Um, so this, this gets us what we're looking for, right? So the, the upper, all, all the points on the upper right represent stations where service is poor compared to average and service at all the neighboring stations is also part of the average. But now we want to do this next step and just pull out like, which of these are actually the worst? And we're going to jump here a little bit and think, think of worst in terms of, in a little bit of a statistical sense and say, which are the ones that are least likely uh, to be observed under random chains, right? The way we actually do our statistics here is computationally, which just means that we are going to have the computer shuffle the map a thousand times for every single point. And that's going to give us a, a distribution of sort of possible arrangements. And then we can say the actual arrangement that we see where this value is high, uh, the, the reliability is very poor, and the neighboring reliability is very poor. How unlikely is that to happen? Chance. And that pulls out these sort of pseudo significant points, right? Um, again, here we have to set a threshold for what we consider unlikely. And the threshold we use is, is, is 1%. We are asking for only the locations that have 1% uh, or, or, or uh, sorry, at the 99% or greater chance of, so I got your out the statistics. Uh, <laughs> we're looking for points that have um, a less than 1% chance of possibly occurring under a random chance, right? And, and those are the ones that we can call Significant. If you're a real estate decision, you won't use significant because what we're doing is an analytic is computational, but close enough. None of that matters. 
<laughs> what it gives us, <laughs> what it gives us is is some real hot spots that we can look at, and, and that's that's like what that's maybe what to take away from this is that this is a method for picking out hot spots. What you see on the right, uh, this is um, this is a sort of the, the continuous data that the chart plot that we looked at at the beginning. Where are we? We are okay. Right. Uh, we've computed our significant points, and now we're just going to be able to compare them on the map, right? So the far right is the map that we started with, which is this sort of like the this is the continuous uh, range of the data by by availability. So this is what we saw at the beginning that you have you know all these these dark red spots with very poor availability, and it's sort of a, a continuum to better availability. But now the middle uh, the the map on the left, which we've just computed, these are uh, sort of our, our our hot spots that we've computed to be the ones that are um, have poor reliability, are surrounded by other stations with poor reliability, and that's especially unlikely to happen under random chance. Yeah. Um, it is quite better, like we surrounded by other poor stations. What about the yellow slash more white? Like those look like the outliers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is yeah, absolutely. Um, these are. Uh, points that we didn't actually consider for this analysis, but these are interesting things to look at as well. So these are um, significant locations where a very low value is surrounded by other high values or the opposite, where a very high value is surrounded by other low values. Um, what we were looking for here again was sort of clusters of continuous poor service. And so we were looking just at that upper right quadrant. Um, but you could also look, you know, there, there may, be, may be interesting things to explore in these, in these data, or there may be interesting things, certainly interesting things to explore in other data, where you might have a point that, you know, for some reason, all of its neighbors are, are, are doing very poorly, but that spot is doing very well. And then you might, you know, you might look at, well, is it just like a data problem? Is it something weird about this one station that it's, you know, four times as big as the other, so it always has bikes available? Is it a really popular spot and people like don't know that there are other bike search stations nearby? There could be a lot going on there, but these are these are all you know would all be interesting spots to go look at. Like what is what is going on there? Um, but rather than being hot spots, they're sort of uh, yeah you can think of them as, as spatial outliers. Okay, um, we are basically done with the statistics here, uh, but we run this over each of the three measures that we looked at. Right, so frequency that. Um, stations are, are unavailable because they have no bikes or no docks, the duration that stations have no bikes or no docks, and the uh, the portion of docks with broken bikes. So those are three measures. We run the same process over each of them and then join them all together um, and say a station is poorly served if it's in a hotspot, significant hotspot for any of these measures, right? We got a new map. Um, this map shows us the stations that are, are in any of these hotspots for, for poor service, right? There's just a few more steps to do here. We're, we're done with the statistics, but we have to do a little bit more map work because this is giving us stations. But if what we wanted really here is, is what are the clusters? And, and I'm conceiving of those as sort of actual areas where service is, is uniformly poor within that area, right? So first thing we do is, is group these stations uh, together. So just looking at the stations with poor service, Group, them, group together all of the stations uh, within a quarter mile to, to build all these little networks. We drop those groups that have fewer than five stations in them because really what we're looking for is, is groups. And then draw a boundary around that area. Um, once we have those boundaries, then we can go get census tract geometries. So uh, census tracts are, are one of the sort of smallest uh, areas that, that census defines statistics for. Um, we can match up tracks with the poor service areas. And then we can define, so in, in, in red are the poor service areas that, that we've computed, and in orange are the tracks that overlay them. That part gets us to the demographic analysis, so we can aggregate up all of the tracks within the service area, and then all of the tracks that are just within one of the poor service areas, and compare the demographics of those two areas, right? This is a pretty simple comparison, but we see pretty clearly that the poor service area, which is in orange, uh, those areas are home to uh, more Hispanic residents, more black residents, and more lower income poor residents. 
I'll say we could extend this part of the analysis even further, um, dive into some sort of spatial statistics, spatial regression. We looked at that a little bit, um, but for what we wanted to show in this report, this is a very clear and compelling way to demonstrate what's going on, right? Um, we don't sort of need to try to tease out that, you know, city bike is, you know, making its, uh, its planning decisions based on, you know, the, the demographics of the ridership. What we're really showing here is that we have a bunch of areas where we know service is the very worst. And these areas are home to, uh, to populations that are also burdened in a number of other ways. And so, so this is further contributing to inequity. Um, and we can show this on a map too, right? So these are again, our, our, our poor service clusters here in orange. These are the ones that we computed um, overlaid with the portion of the population in that area who are black or Hispanic. All right, um, that's like the bath of it. And then how did I actually do it? Um, yeah, so I've showed you a bunch of maps uh, to give you some sense of what's going on, maps, plots. Um, that's not really what I did. Uh, I didn't do this on maps, I did this through code. Um, I did so on Python uh, using PySol, which is the Python Spatial Analysis Library, which is sort of a federation of a bunch of really useful uh, libraries for doing spatial analysis in Python. Um, I like it because it's super fast. Uh, it's written on top of NumPy array, so it does work really quickly, um, which if you think about it here can be, can be useful. A lot of these things uh, are iterative, right? So we were computing the weighted average across all of the station, uh, the weighted average at, at all of the neighboring stations for each station. We were then uh, computing a thousand permutations for each of those. So being able to do this quickly is, is helpful. Um, PySol also, it works with GeoPandas, GeoData frames, and NumPy arrays. Uh, if you work with Python, those will probably make sense to you. So it's, it's really easy to sort of plug this into your workflow. Um, and I'll share some of the, the code I used to do this. Um, but I will also say the methods we used here like are just math. They are in a paper that was published 30 years ago, and so they've been implemented everywhere else. Um, there are packages to do this in R. There are ways to do this in QGIS or in ArcGIS. Um, and I'm also going to flag here Geoda, which is another standalone desktop piece of software. Um, so it's it's not writing code. It's, it's clicking buttons, but it's specially designed for doing this type of statistical spatial analysis. Um, okay, I'm going to pause there. Uh, I have a little bit more of a practical how-to to jump into, but um, this was some heavy methods, and if people want to understand this better, I'd be happy to explain it, or we can jump into just like how to go do this. Yeah. Can I, well, first off, that was awesome. Thanks, Dan, so much for sharing that. Uh, on the graph that you had with the X and Y axis, yeah. um, what, what does it mean for a negative? Like, I want to know more about the metric you were using to measure um, a city bikes like poor service or something like docs poor service and what a negative mm -hmm. value would look like. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, that's a good catch that I didn't explain. Um, the metric here, so the raw metric is a percentage. So this is the, the frequency that stations are unavailable or the likelihood that if you walk up to a station, they're unavailable. And, and this is computed as the number of instances that we find that a station has no bikes or no docks divided by the total number of instances that we sampled. Um, but then what we do is standardize that value. So these axes are, are standardized. So the zero here represents the mean in the data. Uh, okay. um, you know, in interest, uh, uh, this is too much detail, but an interesting extra wrinkle here is that these data are sort of left skewed. So uh, there, there are fewer values above the mean than there are below the mean. And you can actually kind of even see that here with the density of low values, which means even by, by choosing the mean, we're already choosing, uh, you know, fewer than half the values, the, the very highest, very worst performing stations are, are on that upper right quadrant. Got it. Yeah. Great. Who's intimidated? Who wants to do this? Yeah. So when you talk about the stations where there's 
um, no docks or no bikes, and then you kind of convert that into, um, oh, it's not um, usable. Yeah. When you're looking at the clusters, like in theory, there could be one station that has no docks right next to one station that has no bike. Yes. And that is still kind of a useful area for anyone. You just maybe have to go put it out of your way. But if those just get converted to kind of not in service station, and then that would be clustered in the hot spot. Like, did you think about that? Yeah, um, that's a great flag. And I, I did skip over this a little bit. Part of, I'm kind of showing what we what we actually did, and not exactly why it's what we did, because there was there was a lot of work before we picked those three service measures. Um, looking at, yeah, looked at a lot of things. Looked at just like where there are no docks available in just the morning, where there are no docks available in the evening, where there are no docks available, you know, just on the weekend or just during the weekday. Um, from from analyzing just those different cuts of the data. Uh, we found, you know, unfortunately it's, that's not the case. It would be great if like a full dock was right next to an empty dock. Uh, that's basically not the case that you find that, that if you run this, uh, this same clustering analysis on each of those subsets, you wind up with, with sort of similar clusters. Um, but rather than like, you know, mostly for simplicity rather than like doing, doing and explaining each of you know, a dozen cuts of this measure, we wound up combining it together. Um, but yeah, it is something, you know, if you if you want to take and look at these data further, there's there's definitely more to look at that's that's interesting, even in just like what are the patterns of, you know, where where there are docks but no bikes in just the morning or just the weekend. We didn't include here this because we we're looking at sort of overall reliability. Yeah. Were you able to like interface with City Bike after you finished your analyses? And did they tell you anything that kind of changed your understanding of how things were or like what happened after that? Yeah. Um, we didn't really talk with City Bike until we sort of prepared most of this report. Um, because we, you know, we, we had, we had their raw data of, of in, in other projects that we work on, we often have to like go and ask nicely to get some of the data that we're looking at. And we, we have this, so we, we could look at it and this is like, we believe this data to like be accurate. So we, we could do all this analysis, uh, you know, based on on a real snapshot of, of what's actually going on. Um, City Bike was uh, not that excited about the conclusions that we came up with. Um, this, uh, yeah, they put out a statement after our report that I think made basically no sense um, and didn't didn't like provide any other data. They just said they have another measure of reliability that shows actually Bronx is the second best on reliability. I don't know. Um, so I, I I would have liked probably to have an opportunity to more thoroughly engage with City Bike on some of this. They were uh, they took a pretty defensive posture on it. Um, I'll mention just like just because it's like weird and juicy that this report has had a whole second life in Los Angeles, uh, which has another company operating its city bike uh, operating its bike share system. Uh, but Lyft, which operates our bike share system, had had put in a bid to to become the new operator for LA's bike share system, and the transportation union there that did not want to have a new boss pulled out our report to convince the LA City Council that actually Lyft is a terrible bike operator, uh, which led to another uh, another slightly more detailed uh, counter analysis from City Bike about what they found here. The most interesting part of which was, um, you know, the thing we found is that stations across the Bronx had a really high portion of docks with broken bikes in them. Uh, City Bike in their follow-up report in LA said that the reason is that City Bike riders in the Bronx got too smart and realized that if you mark all of the regular bikes as broken, then you get to take out an e-bike for free. And so that's what they were doing. <laughs> uh, I don't have any way really to validate that, um, but that is that is what they said was happening and they said they fixed it. So maybe this problem has gone away and I'd love for someone to, to take these data and you know take a look at, at whether that problem's gotten better. Yeah. Um, actually, a follow-up to that, Rick, somewhat related around 
doing a follow-up study and seeing if it changes. And also mention that this is the third soon one. Definitely. Thought about it. Are any febanality effects or could we're doing the type of analogous in a different portion of the year? And I guess as you said, it's follow-up it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we looked at the summer months for a few reasons. The first is we started the project in May and that was summer. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to wait a full year to come out with what we found, but also like summer is summer. Th there, there is, you know, as you might imagine, enormous seasonality in the overall ridership of city bike, and and it's the summer months, uh, especially June, that the ridership really peaks. Um, so it seemed like a reasonable time to look at, you know, that that peak ridership period. It would be interesting to see if reliability has gotten better now, either because it's not such a peak ridership time, or if city bike has actually addressed any of the challenges. Um, we don't have plans to do a follow-up, but um, something we could do, or it's something I think any of you could take what we've done and, and do, and we'd be interested to see if it's gotten any better. Yeah? Is there about like your real time locations and the bikes and stalls and hikes? Yeah, uh, this is tricky. There is a separate data set that City Bike publishes that lists every trip. Um, that data is not real time. They publish a month of data at a time at a lag of a month or two whenever they feel like publishing it. Um, I looked at that data early on to see if that would help or be like a different source for this analysis. Uh, it One limitation is that it does not individually identify bikes. It, it identifies trips. It says where a trip started and where a trip ended, but you can't track an individual bike through the system. Um, there is a lot that you could do with that trip data and, and, you know, there's, there's great stuff out there that, that other people have, uh, used that data for that you can, you can check out. Um, my recollection and I, I, this sort of fell out of scope early, so I don't remember exactly my recollection. It, it was hard to match that data with this data in any useful way. Um, and the reason that we use this data set instead is that this gives us a better sense of the reliability at the stations rather than sort of where people are riding. Yeah. Uh, talking about outcomes again. Yeah. It's like, I don't know if it was subsidized by the city or actually discounted by the city bike, but for a lot of the zip codes in those hotspots, there were discounts offered to residents. Yeah. Yeah, City Bike does offer discounts uh, to, I think, to NYCHA residents and definitely to SNAP, um, SNAP benefits recipients. Oh, uh, okay. Status students had residents of the zip code. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we wrote about some of that too in ways that they could, they have those programs already and sort of extend that eligibility. Um, as you know, another way to make sure that city bike is accessible to, to low income riders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look at the map, because the first thing that seems to jump out to me is that, um, these hot spots are, um, the physical extremity in the network. And I'm curious, did you do a comparison of similar demographic to the other elsewhere in the city? Um. Yeah, so that's that's a that's a great point, and I think one of the one of the challenges here is like there are there are like pretty sensible sort of network geometry reasons why the the areas at the edge of the system, the areas at the edge of any system, and like any sort of network are are you know people can only go one way, right? Um, it's hard to do that sort of comparison because of the geography we're including here. Um, City bike doesn't cover the whole city, right? It has it has a, a more limited service area. It covers now all of Manhattan and you know these areas from Sunset Park to Woodside up to some of the Bronx, um, which means it's hard to come up with uh, sort of a comparison area that's not around the edge of the system that has similar demographics. Uh, more could be done there. Um, you could you could sort of like look at at individual. Let, yeah, you could. You could code census tracks by like you know whether they're at the edge of the system or not at the edge of the system, and then do you know some sort of regression there. It's not something we pursued, but I, I think you you could pull something more out there. Yeah. So, question at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned there are eight or five for 
a bike either a station leading forward bike that would be available. That's that's something that's currently active right now, or something that was proposed based on there. Um, it's something that's in City Bikes operating agreement, but as best we can tell, uh, New York City DOT that, that runs this agreement has never collected a fine from City Bike. Well, also, I was just wondering in terms of, like, you have your data because you kind of set up a method of collection. <laughs> is there any way to actually track that outside of, like, City Bike probably has that data, but essentially they would be telling on themselves. Yeah, yeah. Out. So is it, is it, and I guess even to the degree of, would the data collection you that you are doing with kind of the GitHub actions be enough to kind of like prove that you're not doing it? What I guess to the degree does that do those fun? Is there a way to actually like yeah automate add, that? Add yeah, um, I think so. I, I I would put some caution in there just because the you you could build a method to do that the way that we did it we're sort of taking these 15 minute samples. And what we're saying is basically if there's no bike, uh, you know, at nine o'clock and there's no bike at 9.15 and there's no bike at 9.30 and then there is a bike at 9.45, that was a 45 minute duration with no bike. There, you know, there could be times that a bike was returned and then another bike was checked out within that 15 minute time that we're missing. Uh, these data are updated super frequently. So if you were pulling even more frequently, you, you could get closer to like an exact accurate counter that way. Uh, but I think for our purposes and, you know, other research purposes, you can use this to, to get a pretty good idea of what, you know, how many instances and what fine city bike would owe. And, um, it wasn't sort of wasn't within the scope of this project, but like, I, you know, I think you, you could look at these at, you know, closer to real time and just say like how many times today, or what's the fine today that city bike goes for, for not having not meeting the service agreement. Um, you know, our, our recommendation is, yeah, it's like partly that city bike should tell on themselves, but also partly that they should just hand over better data so that, that we can, we can scan this a little bit better. Um, they don't have to like give us a bill to themselves, but if they, if they give us the instances then we can, we can do something more with that. And by we, I really mean, I mean, city DOT who, who, Runs that relationship and that contract. But that's also kind of like a second part of this is just kind of understanding. I know, I know a lot about city bike, but not so much about how it plugs into the city. Like, why? How did this end up as like a, a effort within the controller's offense versus like versus DOT? Okay, how did? It, and I, I guess are you also working with DOT or other also like DOT team? that are working on this as well. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just say, you know, briefly, we looked at it because we're sort of the watchdog for city agencies and city services. Uh, and so wanted to understand how well this city service was performing, particularly as people were, were complaining about it. So this this wasn't a project. We, we also talked with City DOT, the, the, the team that works on this, but this was just within, within our office and the controller's office. Let me talk first about GitHub Actions. Uh, GitHub Actions is a super cool tool. It is basically your own free to use cloud computer that you can set up to do whatever you want. Uh, it's built into GitHub, which is a, a code repository tool. As best I can tell, it's sort of made for um, the kinds of programming where you would you know, build something in TypeScript or React and need to then turn it into JavaScript to publish it to the web. Um, but you can run any code you want. You can run Python scripts, you can run other scripts, and you can run it just on a schedule. Um, if that sounds like a lot, it, it kind of is, but it's really not that hard to set up. Um, so I set up a, a template repo here that, that has the action built in to go get this data and start collecting this data set. So uh, if you want, you can, you can grab this here. I'll share these slides later. If you've got your laptop and you want to go ahead and navigate, go for it. Um, I'll just show you the steps here, but go to this repo. Uh, there's probably a step here I'm missing where you need to fork this repo. Yeah, okay. You need to fork this repo. This repo, uh, this repo has a great readme. If you scroll down the readme, it'll show you exactly how to fork this repo, which just means making your own copy of it, which will copy over everything that's already here. Those instructions also show you how to navigate to this file. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're okay this time. 
<laughs> um, so the the actual action is controlled by this um, this YAML file, which just lists out the actual steps that that the action takes. So first, you give it a schedule. Um, so this is going to happen 10 minutes, 25 minutes, 40 minutes, and 55 minutes after the hour. I've got a link to the syntax that you can use to set this up for any time if you want it every 20 minutes or every Sunday at 8.45 or whatever it is. You, you can pick any time to run it on. Uh, just a note about timing, you, you can schedule it for more frequently than every five minutes. That's the limitation of GitHub Actions. And another limitation is that it won't, it doesn't guarantee it's going to run at exactly the time that you call it for. Uh, the trade-off with this being just a free service for you is that you have to get into the queue and it'll run when it can. Um, that's not ideal for what we're actually doing here, where we would love to just get samples at exactly uh, you know intervals. Um, the trade-off here is that this is free to set up and totally free to use uh, and gets us a good sample of data. But you know, if you want to use this to get uh, exact times, if you want to set this up to get times every one minute, like you can also run this on your own cloud instance. If you have a Mac or Unix system, you can run exactly this cron tab on your own computer. You'll just have to leave it open all the time. Wait, does that mean that sometimes it didn't pick it up every 15 minutes when we're okay? Good. Yep. Um, yeah, I skipped over this too, but we did sort of built in some like circuit breakers to, to check for those missing data points, especially when looking at durations, right? Um, so when we were counting durations of missing bikes, if we were missing more than 40 minutes of data, we just kind of chucked that data and moved on. Um, so set this up. The only thing that you'll have to change here is just uh, changing the schedule it runs on. Um, and then there, there are two other things that you have to turn on. Read that readme. It'll show you exactly the button that you just have to click OK, I agree to. And then boom, it'll start just pulling down data at the schedule that you say. Um, so you can start this right now. Whenever you feel like you have enough data, you can run a notebook in there that's uh, called Build Dataset, which is also referenced in the README, and it'll take each of those samples. Um, OK, one more step. You should probably clone this to your local machine and then pull all of the data samples, which are going to be stored in GitHub, pull them down onto your local machine. Then you can run this notebook that'll build all of those data samples into a single data set. And this is what I showed at the top, but it's indexed by time and by station. And then you can do you know, whatever you want with this. Um, but I've also included code notebooks that go through more or less exactly what we did. So the way that we built these measures, the way that we computed these clusters of poor service, uh, the way that we calculated the instances, uh, or rather the, the count of, of violations of their service agreements. Um, so if those are interesting, check those out. If those are interesting because you actually realize you don't care at all about city bike, but you want to do you know similar demographic comparisons or similar spatial analysis on anything else that you have you know that exists in space and you want to find clusters for, go ahead and, and take them for that. Um, let me know if you do anything cool with them. Um, but that's that's really it. I, I wanted I, I wanted to provide like exactly the tools that we use and make them usable because I would love for people to extend this. This is. You know, as I said at the beginning, not yet a data set that's available on open data, but it is free and public to use if you just start recording it. And so anything you want to know about city bikes reliability is, is there for you once you start pulling down this data and, and taking a look at it. Um, does anyone have questions about that? Or should I do like an even more hands-on version of this? I think that's going to be a little bit much. If you are interested in doing this, Go to this repo. I've I've left in the readme like step by steps how to clone this and uh, fork this and, and set it up your own little copy of it. Um, tried to make this as easy as I can, but do let me know if you run into challenges. Uh, we have we have ten more minutes. Okay, what else do people want to know? Great, we have a slow clock and we have seven minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Knowing that Lyft has a lot, like, Lyft has kind of like unified a lot of their systems for the bike sharings. Do you know if this has been applied to any other, any of the other systems? Um, I don't think, I don't know of anyone else doing this research on the other systems. Uh, but that's a great point that this is the data that this is using 
It's called the general bike share feed specification. It's modeled off of the general transit feed specification. I'm familiar with that, but um, it's a standardized feed for every bike share system, every bike share system in the world that wants to share their data with with any navigating apps. Um, so if you wanted to take a look at any other bike share system, you would just have to find the URL for the feed and swap it in. Uh, actually, I can't show you. There's there's a there's a Python file in here that actually goes and gets the data, uh, just calls a request to the URL that has the, the station's data. Um, take a little, just a little bit of work just to verify that the, the schemas are exactly the same, but it's a standard schema, so it should be, and so that should work. Uh, so I guess I should let my friends in LA know that they can they can do this to further <laughs> a bench lift there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 Um, which is where this report came from. Um, we like to know where we think there are problems, where the city is not delivering services adequately or equitably. Uh, and part of it's also dependent on what we can actually find the data to answer some interesting questions on. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it at like a, a very high level. Um, you know, I'll say like it, it's great to be at an open data conference because a lot of the work that we in our office do is really based on open data. Um, parts of the controller's office like have access to other city agency data, but most of what we do, we're doing quickly with what we can find available online. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that it's based off of, I guess, complaints or feedback that you heard. So do you publish things for forms kind of engage that public? Like, we like dive in on what they asked it. Or is that my see just like you signed over to sitting by and for Yeah. Um whew. yeah. Uh yeah. So um we yeah. The point of the work that we do is to inform the public and to, to shape policy change. Um so really we work I work in a it's called the Bureau of Policy and Organizing. So I work with some people who do a lot of research on these policies and some people who are spending a lot more time on the communities. Uh, with residents, with organizations, talking about what the challenges are, and then reporting back what we're finding. Um, and we look to publish these reports widely to try to actually make some change. Yeah. Can you share um, a little bit more about projects that, like fun projects, recent projects you're currently working on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the things I'm working on, uh, yeah, this is relevant for today's weather, but I've been working on an investigation into the, the city's readiness for flash flooding. Um, looking specifically, uh, there was a, a major flood event at the end of September last year um, that uh, caused some real flooding and, and there were some, some challenges with sort of coordination between city agencies. So uh, Looking into that as sort of a test case for how the city is handling these, you know, increasingly frequent flash flooding events we have. Um, I'm doing right now some research on housing and homelessness, also, which have been, you know, increasingly important issues. Um, looking to sort of, uh, you know, tell some story of the the population of homeless New Yorkers, and then looking particularly at some of the policies to provide counsel to tenants in housing court to prevent evictions. Um, yeah, those are, those are kind of the, the fun ones on my list right now, but, uh, I have a fun job because I work across all sorts of issues and partner with subject matter experts and other groups in, in all these topics. Yeah. I think we have two more minutes and there's a question. Yes. Yeah. A question. yeah. Have you these projects that you like were working on, but, um, like you put in uh, like you try to rip now, but you couldn't find the right data, or like it didn't get <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a, that is a real challenge that we, we often start out projects with a thing that we want to answer, right? So like in this project, it was like, is City Bike getting less reliable for riders? 
uh, we often have to answer the questions with the data that's available to us. And so like already you might notice I kind of cheated and we didn't actually answer is city bike getting less reliable, but we're showing that city bike is not reliable and that's a problem. Um, you know, part of that is because we didn't have the historical data here. Um, there are, yeah, there are other projects that we look into either data that other agencies should be sharing and aren't sharing in a way that we can use or that we request from other agencies and they don't keep the data that we wish they kept because it's not, you know, for their business purposes. The research we want to do isn't the way that they're keeping records. Um, so there, yeah, I will say broadly, there's, there's a lot of ways that we are limited in, in the kinds of questions that we can answer. And so we, we try to find what are things that are meaningful and that we can sort of truthfully give an answer to from the data that we can get in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Staying with that idea. Yeah. Um, what data do you look to to identify the disruptions that are happening in the city or where the concerns are? Is there a formal process you go through or is it more anecdotal? Um, it's more it's it's anecdotal but it's structuredly anecdotal so like we we have have a big team of people who are constantly talking with community groups and other advocates to sort of get that that pulse of problems that are out there and that's where a lot of the ideas come from for things that we can look at um you know, we're also just sort of tuned into city news and city politics and that surfaces uh ideas as well um it is, uh, it is a source that we use for some of our analysis. Uh, I mean, I think maybe the disappointing answer is like, we don't have a data methodology for deciding what to research. We have a methodology that says like, what can we write an impactful report about given what are things that people care about? What are things that are not going well? And what are things that we can find data to analyze? Yeah. Just really quickly, yeah. the last amount of data you were pulling in, what were you saving it to? Like an on-prem server? Or was it just the GitHub cloud or like what was what it? Yeah, the raw data that came in is first just stored onto GitHub. Um, yeah, I will say one other limitation to doing it that way is that GitHub caps your capacity somewhere around a gigabyte. And so after four or five months of this, I'd filled up and then my action kind of started slowing down. Um, but that was, uh, that was four or five gigabytes after a few months. And then I just put that all on my local hard drive and was running it there. Yeah. Uh, I think we're out of time. And so I should let you all go to lunch, but I will keep standing here. And so if people have questions, I would love to answer more questions. Thank you. Thank you.